No, they don't want to see that. Okay, why don't you go ahead and start us? Okay. 2019 was a great year for In the Hangar. I'm Christy Wong. And I'm Dan Milliken, and we appreciate you guys watching today. Christy and I are going to look back at the best In the Hangar moments from 2019. Christy, what comes to mind first for you? Oh, the first thing that comes to my mind is the live episode with DPE Joe Johnson. All right, so in, I guess it was August, we did our one of our first live episodes ever, and uh, Joe Johnson, the DPE for my commercial fly, have you ever had? No, you've only used one DPE. No, I've used, two, I've used two. Oh yeah, but it was mm -hmm. not Joe Johnson. But it wasn't Joe. Mm -mm. Well, we brought Joe Johnson on live, and we are able to get your feedback, and absolutely, that was a great episode. It was, I love that episode. All right, so Alexander is asking that um, he, he's gonna start training, is there a benefit to using the same DPE throughout all the check rides? There's a handful of uh, aviators in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex that have used me for their uh, ride from zero to hero, if you will. Um, there is. Once you establish that rapport, obviously each check ride becomes uh, a little less stressful because you now have a relationship per se, but you have to make sure that you maintain that boundary and that it's not crossed where you there's an expectation that you're going to get be given credit or pass for something that is substandard, if you will. In other words, oh, I, he's my friend, so he's going to let me through. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. We're not supposed to establish a, a friendship in the manner in which we would allow someone with less than the minimum requirements be, you know, moved forward. Okay, well, that was the first thing that Christy thought about was that episode. The first thing that came to my mind was when Brian hijacked at the beginning of the year our studio. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Some so someone posted on the Facebook looking for the which Facebook? The one I use. Have you been on it? Yes. The, okay. the Facebook. Well, well, well it's not. So it's the, not the exact, anymore and more. It's just just face, Facebook. Uh, no, uh, here he just talk. Okay. So the guy said someone has made a complaint. And I had a 50-50 reaction, like, either this is a joke, but then there was this sheer terror because I have made some video. Are you familiar with the website called YouTube.com? Vaguely. Okay. You know, we got a lot of flack for that episode um, because people thought we were making fun of some people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> No, Maybe not we at all. That that. We were making fun of some people named Brian Turner. We were making fun of Brian Turner, absolutely. But um, that uh, app was a lot of fun. It made us talk funny. Yeah. Um, I love the new segment that we started on Baller Pilots. Baller Pilots. Baller Pilots. It gave us an opportunity to really highlight some of the amazing, wonderful, and uh, incredible pilots that we have out there. And we didn't even know they're right here in our backyard. And they've done some amazing things. So. Yeah, I'd like to stretch that even further and start getting baller pilots from all over the world if we can. Yeah. But uh, take a look at these baller pilots. Standing in front of the TV and seeing the helicopter lifting a flight attendant out of the water, at that moment, as unusual as an aircraft accident is, I put the pilot job and the airlines together as a career, and I decided to be an airline pilot. General would come down and... He had to fly so many hours, and he was getting ready to fly a mission, and uh, he got sick. The stand eval officer that was his IP got sick, so they said, Lieutenant Flager, would you get in the back seat with the general? So I said, sure. So we took off, and he had a mission up in the, in the DMZ area, and it was, again, it was a night 1,000-foot uh, flight, and... Uh, and with a general? Mm -hmm. He was in the front and I was in the Brigadier? back. Brigadier? Back seat, uh, two star. Two star. Yeah. And on the third, it was night and there was a little bit of weather, and on the third leg that we flew of about 10 legs, he got vertigo. And he said, we're gonna have to abort the mission. And I, I said, no sir, I got the airplane. So I grabbed the stick and I was flying it with my elbow and running the cameras with my other hand. And I flew three legs and uh, he says, uh, Lieutenant, my vertigo's gone away. Is it uh, okay if I fly the airplane? I said, General, this is your plane. You, you do whatever you want. So he flew the last three legs, and 
when we landed back at Don Sanut, uh, the crew comes out and, you know, with the general, you get the staff car with the flag on it and everything, and uh, they pull the film out. We wrote the airplane up for, you know, what was wrong with it. And then we drove up to uh, the photo lab when we did, probably 30 people came running out. And I thought, well, that's the difference when a general comes to the photo lab versus a lieutenant, lieutenant. or a captain. And so we're walking up and the chief master sergeant says, Lieutenant, this is the first time the general's ever gotten a target, you know, 100%. Because, <laughs> you know, if you get vertigo on the third leg, you're not going to get it. No. So guess who flew with the general for the next three or four <laughs> times that he flew? Which reminds me that one of my uh, episodes I remember was talking to the air traffic controllers about 9-11. Yes. That was a crazy episode. That was. I remember somebody coming around the corner from a break and said, hey, something's going on in the World Trade Center. It's like, you know, I just kind of heard that a little bit because as controllers, you multitask, you want to hear what's going on around you. Um, and he ran the break list. So I don't need to explain a break list, but he, but he got to me and says, hey, would you like to take a break? Um, I like to work traffic, and normally I would have stayed there and worked it, but because of what he said coming around the corner, something's going on. I said, yeah, I want to take a break, because just like you, um, in our break room, which we had a cafeteria with a big screen TV, so I took the break, went down, saw the second airplane hit, and there, our breaks were about 30 minutes, so my break was over. I went back in, and by the time I, I went back, yeah. I still get chills. The heebie-jeebies, yeah. Yep. But went back into the control room, and it was my turn to run the break list, and by that time, they were already telling airplanes to land. So I found a position to work. Um, I do remember we have uh, a sector called Monroe Low, which Barksdale Air Force Base is in that sector. Shreveport Approach controls that. And I remember after all the airplanes were landed, uh, Air Force One came in without a flight plan in the computer, which is really unusual. Normally you'll put in the flight plan information and it generates automated flight progress strips. He came through with hand printed strips. So it means somebody in Memphis Center called Fort Worth Center passed the flight plan information verbally, and we did handwritten strips, but nothing in the computer on that. And the Air Force One, I'd never seen, I worked him before, he had an F-15 on each wing tip, and that's when he had come from Florida and landed at Barksdale, stayed there for a couple hours, and then as you, as you know, he went up to Offutt, and then they decided it was safe to go back to D.C. and went back to D.C. But yeah, I'll see if I can get Tom on because then he can talk about, because it was just, I think it was him and his son, and he took off from his little grass strip, Unaware. and all of a sudden he had, got intercepted. Mm. Yeah, and they were like, you know, like that to him, so. I have a friend who's a psychologist. He came onto the show to talk about women versus men in the cockpit. Bear. What did you think about hug that? Hug the bear. Bear, yeah, hug the bear. <laughs> Uh, I thought that was a really, really interesting episode, and to be honest, I thought it was going to be a little bit more controversial than I it thought so being. Too. I thought so, yeah, too. Yeah, it was actually, I, I think, too, we were kind of walking a fine line there, because we, you know, our intention is not to insult anybody or, right. you know, offend anybody, but we, I think it's important to talk about these these particular topics. I think, you know, when you're in, a, in a, a male environment and you think about competition and things like that, it's 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 going to be different for a male to lose to another male at some level versus a male to lose to a female, right? Because if a male loses a male, we can always kind of cut our losses. Oh, you're better than this. If a male loses to a female, it's generally a, a bigger ego blow. And then uh, Bear, Dr. Bear, Dr. Jeremiah, came back for another one on anxiety and fear of flying. Yes. That's where we hug the bear. Hug the bear. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that, to me, was one of probably one of my favorite episodes ever. Yeah, we were able to talk to a subject matter expert on kind of why these things happen, you know? Yeah. Like why people feel the way they do when they're flying. You viewed that situation not as something that was gonna consume you, but you, or something that, you viewed it as a challenge basically. Yeah, something it was a to challenge. It was something to conquer, it's something in front of you, it's a mountain to climb, it's yeah. the next thing in front of you. And that's a big distinguisher between people who hold on to anxiety forever versus people who kind of beat it. If you look at it as a challenge, you're going to move through it much quicker. I I mean, I ha you know, they say you fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. I have Absolutely. literally looked at myself in the mirror and been like, you are Christy freaking Wong. <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> you can be the airplane, you know, like <laughs> yeah. be one with the airplane. You can do this. And then I did. Yeah. And I'm a, a much better person and a much better pilot for it. Yeah. We call that bear hugging the anxiety. So, oh, so your body's going like, 
run away, run away, run away, run away, run away. That's that's what you do when your sympathetic nervous system gets kicked up. Let's oh, get away, get away, get the away. The fight or flight is real. And but instead, what you did is you went like, this is a challenge. I can I can take this on. And so you you hug the you hug the anxiety and just jump back into it. And then to find out that bear is afraid of flying. That <laughs> was actually my favorite part of that episode. So yes. you land in the parking ask lot. Ask him if he'll go fly with you. Would you I go don't fly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, I knew okay. that was coming. So, <laughs> it's him and my wife. So tell me about this, I get Jeremiah. motion sick really easy. Actually, that can be overcome. I get motion sick in the Walmart parking lot. Hug the bear. <laughs> hug the bear. So we're gonna hug the bear. Oh, we're, yeah, hug the bear. We're gonna start you off with a half a Duramamine. I bet I can get wait, you wait, over wait. it. <laughs> Probably. You know what? Do you, do you get motion sickness when you drive? Yeah. When I'm driving, I get motion sick. Are you freaking kidding me? Oh, that's, 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 You're and my just wife a broken is, person. I know, it's, it's terrible, God. isn't it? Yeah, him and my wife. Um, <laughs> I wonder if she would go up with me. No. You don't I think it. so? I, we could try, but I doubt it. Please, let me try. I would love that, but yeah. She probably I'll won't. take her. You know what I'll do? I'll. It'll be like a date. I will set it up perfectly. It'll be like a nice, calm, smooth morning. Beautiful. I'll bring her roses. Uh, Something. Like, well... What's, does she like chocolates or something? I'll just leave chocolates on the front seat and then, ah, <laughs> And then gotcha. she'll throw them up all over your wrong water. Oh no, I'll take her out on a nice smooth morning. I, you know, I think that she would be fine, but I just don't know that you'll ever get her in there. Uh, I mean, I would still like to try. I would, I would too. If she were, were to actually be okay with flying, it would change my life. Exactly, I think it's worth, I think it's worth trying. And if you're gonna send her up with anybody, yeah, I'd set her up. Who yeah. better to set her up yeah, with? I agree me. with that. I agree I with I think that. you trust me. Mm -hmm. What about the Fat Tire Cowboys? Oh, I like them. They're cool. So they brought in uh, information about that Yak 110 you see at all the air shows. Yeah. So. Anyway, he flew the thing in, and we took the wing off this side and the wing off that side and uh, kind of stuck them together in the hangar and went, yeah, that's going to look cool when we get it done. <laughs> and so uh, 14 months later, we flew it with the jet. So we flew it without the jet in a year. So uh, it was a pretty quick process, you know, to get, get it going. You know, we had a lot of opportunity to talk to Josh Flowers and we, we mm -hmm. talked to him about a couple of things. I talked to him about his trip uh, along from Florida all the way to the West Coast. He got ramp checked, you know, in I think Louisiana or Mississippi. Um, you got to talk to him about Alaska. Yeah. That was yeah. a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, just, I personally would love to do that. I'm not jealous at all. Okay, maybe like <laughs> yeah. maybe like 12% jealous. Did you watch any of that footage? I'm like 100%, 110% oh, jealous. Oh, trust me. I Yeah, I'm trying to play it cool here, okay? Uh, but, I, I mean, just the experiences that Josh gets to do, uh, just that kid. Uh, it's hard to narrow it down. We went to Soldovia, Alaska, this tiny little village, 1,800-foot dirt strip and the approach is really crazy. You gotta come over the water and dodge the trees and then you're, you're turning final, you're rolling out on final as you're flaring and touching the ground. So it's just, it's a real cool approach. He's actually, he's an amazing person though. He's, he's taken two of his passions that he's, I mean, just really good at. Mm -hmm. He's put them together and he's made something really great with it, so. Yeah, storytelling and aviation and, and he really has yeah. merged the two together. The other thing, you know, and flying with Josh, this yeah. past year, what what really struck out to me, or struck out what really struck me was how precise he is as a pilot, and it's something that I don't find um, ingrown in me. Yeah. So I have to really struggle to be precise, and, and it was a great um, kind of a learning lesson for me that you know turn off the idle pilot yeah. and actually fly a straight line. Okay, what other show stuck out to you in 2019? Uh oh. Cameron, the emergency episode. Cameron Morrison, uh, you know, a, a not a high time pilot, which you, we've been talking to a lot of different pilots that have experienced emergencies with 10,000, 20,000 hours, you're bound something to happen. This is a guy who had what, 500 or something. Yeah. And he's out there with his family in a single engine piston and, and it dies on him. That yeah. was scary. That was, yeah. That was exactly a year ago mm. that that happened to him. That's right. Yes, uh, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Uh... Comanche 5 Papa's lost power. Comanche 5 Papa, roger. I've got uh, on the airport at your 12 o'clock and 1 5 miles. So um, at that point, they uh, I, I'm on my 430, and I set my 430 to the nearest airport, 
and uh, ATC is directing me to the nearest airport. I was uh, 15 miles out from the nearest airport, and uh, I'm setting my best glide speed. I keep my gear up, my flaps up, so I can glide as far as possible. Exactly me for that. You got a heading port. November five nine or popping. Since you're uh, just turned five degrees right, since you're one o'clock and uh, about one five miles. I found I found the road and, and found a spot in the road that looked good and asked for the winds and made sure you know I was pointing into the winds and uh, made I found a spot on the road pretty much treated it like it was in, like it was a runway and I just made a downwind a base leg and then uh, turned final while top. gliding oh yeah gliding the we, whole time no did it surprise you how much altitude you lost whenever you had to bank. And if uh, you're doing a pattern like that? So doing the pattern like that, yeah, whenever I turned, uh, when I was on the downwind, I guess, of this highway, right. I, uh, I I was expecting to lose a lot of altitude a, a lot quicker than I ever had. But I, I still had the gear, I had the flaps, had everything up. Okay. So um, I, when I made the base, yeah, um, I, I mean, I was, I was dropping pretty quick. But I, I didn't drop the gear, I didn't drop the flaps, I didn't drop anything until I was over the road, had the road made. And uh, at that point, I dropped everything and uh, descended onto the road, flared, and I mean, it was <laughs> just like landing at any any airport. No wires, was, no, no telephone lines. So if 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 I had there was there was different spots to the road, and <clears> there <throat> was there was if I went up a little bit, there was power lines, there was uh, trees, houses. If I went the other direction, same thing. It was windy, and I like I said, I found a, a spot in the road that was. Uh, that was it was flat and and i from where i was at it didn't look like there was any power lines okay so i thought it was fun you know we got there early and i just thought let's find out a little bit about christy wong so we interviewed you you remember oh gosh, that yeah i do <laughs> i got to take my first commercial airline ride when i was about 10. um i will never forget the flight from Salt Lake City to Boise, Idaho. I think it was a SkyWest flight. And it was, so it was one of those little regional, you know, prop, like turbo props. And this was pre 9-11. And the uh, flight attendant came up and said, hey, would you like to come up and meet the pilots? And I was like, uh, yeah. So she walked me up there and the pilot, he just took time showing me, you know, this button, that button, and just looking out of the cockpit. And I remember him saying, hey, you see that down there? That's the Snake River. I wish I could find that pilot. Like, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to look for him. He had such a positive impact on my life. Mm -hmm. He wound up giving me those little wings. Mm -hmm. And I remember wearing those like every day until they broke when I was in fifth grade. Wow. Because it was like, and I, I just, I, I can't even explain like the, the emotion that that brings up to me because I was like, all right, yeah, I wanna fly. Yeah. Okay, well then later we added this interview of Christy Wong that Brian did. My non-interview. So, all right, I don't have any other questions for this particular episode, but uh, is there maybe we can get Chrissy on next time. Yeah, yeah, see if you could. Have you ever actually interviewed her on your show? Uh, yeah, I have. have um, you? Yeah, did you air it? I don't remember. Little, but sometimes she shows up. Oh, okay. Do you pay her? Does she work for free? No, she works for free. Okay. If she goes off to the airlines or something, you think you'd ever take another sidekick like someone else? Um, probably not. Okay. So tell us, how was that set up? Uh, the non-interview, Yeah. I sat there and- You were told not to say a word. I waited to be acknowledged. I never was. Brian, thank you. Thank you, Brian. But I'm a good sport. You are. You are a good sport. <laughs> Surprising me, a couple of our best, our most viewed videos, I won't say best, our most viewed videos have been on the Piper wing spar issue and the Cessna 177-210 wing spar issue. Mm -hmm. That has surprised me. Those actually in view counts lead just about everything. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a pretty serious topic and people want to know. Yeah. I don't think there's enough, I think there's a lot of information out there, but it really diving down into it, you know what I mean? And being able to explain it to the mass public, that's where people really want to see those videos. That's what we did. We were yeah. able to talk about it in such a way that people understand. Well, and Bill brought, you know, uh, learn visual aids that really helped me understand yes. what was happening like with the Piper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it was very good. Yeah. So what we, what we have here is we have eight bolts on the top, 10 bolts on the bottom, and it bolted in. That's pretty simple stuff, okay? Now, when we look at it, there's eight bolts on the top, 10 on the bottom, because on the bottom, more loads, Okay, it's not an aerobatic airplane. 
So that's the way it's designed. It's been that way since the 1960s when it was originally designed. So that's pretty much the concept. Now this is the problem. Well, this is, what we'll do is we'll take the wing out here. Okay, now where the accident aircraft occurred, or the, the, the issue on the accident aircraft is right here, you see the outer bolts. Let's bring that up Yeah, here. bring it up where we yeah, can yeah. see it. Right where these outer bolts, this is the outside, inside of the plane here, outside here. Where that happened, we're gonna put a little line across. Right there on the bottom of that spar. That's where the accident, the Daytona Beach accident occurred. Okay. okay. This is the problem. So now you want to inspect your aircraft, right? You want to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, now what we do is we bolt this into the aircraft. Okay, we're going to slide it in here. I've got a little mark. Okay, now, Christy, you tell me how easy it is to inspect. Yeah, it's not. Exactly. So, you know, somebody I actually enjoyed having on the show is Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. And, I mean, he's just incredible and he's got so many great stories. But I think one of my favorite episodes with him was with Joe Casey doing the single versus twin discussion. You had two guys who, first of all, personality-wise, they're like the nicest guys in the world. Oh, so nice. But then they know their, they know their stuff, like, way out there. I mean, they're geniuses in, in aviation. And yeah. So it was great to see these great guys and great knowledge talk about, you know, a single versus twin engine situations. Yeah. And and it surprised me really when um, the, the question that surprised me the most was um, if you're going over the Gulf of Mexico um, and you had a choice between the PT-6 um, uh, turbine prop, right. turboprop, no, yeah, turbo, or the... Uh, or a twin piston and what their answer was. Oh, absolutely. You want to answer that or me? Uh, I'll answer the question. I'll take a single PT-6. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. You give all me a, a 421 versus a Pilatus PC-12, for example. Right. I take the PC-12 all day it's, long. It's for safety. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of uh, just amazing knowledge and being able to, it's not just about the knowledge, it's also about being able to portray it, which Joe Casey's uh, Slips. Description on the slips and skids. That was really cool. Yeah, so a couple of uh, months before we shot in the hangar for for um, season three, mm -hmm. um, I went through my CFI initial, and, and Joe Casey was my DPE. And I walked out of there feeling like I didn't know anything about aviation. Oh, yeah. And uh, But but after we were done, Joe had, had demonstrated to me that slip skid uh, thing, and it rocked my world. And by the comments you guys have left, it rocked quite a few of y'all's world as well. Yeah. So let me explain the why behind right. that. Okay. If you notice, I'm going to put the airplane into a slip where it's left bank, right pedal. And if your eye line, remember the airplane's flying directly towards you uh, as you see this, you can see how this upper wing is it's blanked. Blocked. It's blanked by the fuselage. The fuselage now has dirty air because the air is coming over the fuselage, hitting the wing with dirty air. So this upper wing is going to be the wing that's going to stall first. Right. And when this upper wing stalls first, so if I have a higher angle attack, the upper wing stalls, the airplane merely returns back to a position of normalcy. If I go the other way with a, with a slip as well, in other words, I go right bank, left pedal, you can see the same thing. The upper wing is blanked. And the upper wing is gonna be the one that stalls first in a high angle of attack. Now let's talk about a skid. Okay. A skid is where if you bank to the left and then you add left pedal, you can now see that the fuselage blanks the lower wing. So if I get in a high angle attack, the lower wing is going to be the one that's going to stall first, losing lift, and the airplane's going to fall over on its back. I can do it the other way, just the same. You can go right. over right bank, right pedal, and you notice the lower wing is blanked. And so when this lower wing loses lift, it's going to flip over on its back. And when it flips over on its back, the airplane's going to enter into a spin. Another episode that stuck out to me was Martin Polly who is from Germany originally, oh, about yes. how good the U.S. has it in general aviation. Because we have it good. I've been like thinking, oh, you know, complaining about this FBO and that and all this kind of stuff and how hard the FAA is or whatever. What we have in the United States, it surprised me mm -hmm. compared to what like Europe and the rest of the world has. Yeah, and I've never flown across the seas like that. Like I've never flown anywhere else out, you know, other than the United States. So... That was really eye-opening. What I'd throw out there is that uh, it's, it's easy to take what we have here in the U.S. for granted, uh, but it can change. And I think if, if we look closely, we can see little bits and pieces of signs of, of change, you know, with more airports getting closed or fenced in, access to airports getting 
more difficult or more expensive you know, with uh, FBOs charging higher fees. So it's a trend that you know, if, if we don't push against it and, and help organizations like AOPA right. uh, through our support um, or the uh, airport support networks that are at, uh, at local airports that are in danger, uh, you know, these organizations deserve our support. Um, my fear is that you know, by the time people that were born and raised here and have never flown anywhere outside the luxurious American GA environment, you know, by, by the time we see the damage, it's going to be too late to repair it. 2019 was an amazing year for In the Hangar. So if you want to be part of our 2020 wrap-up, please reach out to one of us. We'd love to have you on the show. Yes, and if you want to reach out to us, uh, reach out at Facebook is probably the best way. We have a Facebook group called Taking Off, one word. So we look forward to hearing from you guys, and uh, we'll see you next time in the hangar. Thank you.